Hi, I'm Carl Taylor. Welcome to Carl Taylor Live on Facebook, live on YouTube, hopefully as well. Now, today, uh, I've got a few things to talk about, a few subjects. I'll also be taking your questions. Uh, questions related to photography, that is. No marital advice questions, please. Um, right, um, I'll take your questions. First, we're going to look at a few things and then I'm going to give you a little tutorial. We're going to look at the new liquify functions in Photoshop today. Now, some of those that of you that follow our training on Carl Taylor Education, you know we've got some really in-depth Photoshop tutorials as well as our photography tutorials. Um, but there's been some upgrades on the liquify function in Adobe Photoshop uh, and they're quite interesting. I've actually been using them for uh, a couple of shoots and people shots and um, they're particularly useful for those that do portraiture or business portraits. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration and an insight into uh, the power of those functions and features. Now, as usual, I've got this iPad here and someone will feed me questions from YouTube and from Facebook. Um, a, a few weeks ago, someone complained that I didn't answer their question or something or other, or I didn't get the name right. But the fact that someone's porting me these questions and there's a little bit lost in translation, tough luck, okay? Right, now let's move on. Um, I wanna talk about, first of all, um, a couple of things that I've seen um, in the news. Um, let me just get my web browser open. Uh, I'm gonna come back to that one. This is a new camera a 10 by 8 inch digital back. Look at the size of that digital sensor compared to that iPhone that's lying alongside it. Now this all made for interesting reading. I thought, oh yeah, large format. I used to shoot large format. Here's a bit of blurb about the camera. And you know, it looks like the old view cameras. We had Sean Conboy on our live show the other week. He does a lot of photography on large format cameras, but he uses like this digital back. I've, I've lost the picture off this TV, by the way. Um, so he uses this uh, large uh, format type camera, but he puts uh, like a Hasselblad digital back on there. And um, what this camera does is it's just a giant 10 by 8 inch sensor designed for those people that are interested in, uh, you know, landscape photography or whatever the hell it is. Um, let me just go back on this. But the thing that surprised me about this thing was I thought it was going to be expensive because I thought, wow, you know, this is like, um, why, is my, why is my browser not working now? Nothing is working here. Anyway, so I thought, yeah, this is interesting. Um, it's, it's going to be expensive because this thing's going to be like a, a 200 megapixel camera. But it turns out that this thing is only 12 megapixel. So I was like, what's going on? So then I started to think, well, what is the advantage of this thing? Because it costs like $100,000. And what it is, it's the micron size of the sensors, of the photo sites, the, the pixels effectively. And because they're larger, they're sort of light gathering capability, their tonal range, those sort of things, diffraction issues, uh, it, it can apparently make for uh, a better image with greater tones, etc., which is why I shoot medium format. So it'd be interesting to see how this thing pans out because that is a tremendous amount of money for a camera. Uh, I'm not sure who's going to be willing to shell out a hundred grand uh, to, to work with that sort of format, but who knows? Um, maybe they should look at making it a slightly higher resolution though, so it's got more appeal. Um, right, next thing I want to talk about um, is uh, the Association of Photographers Awards from 2017. I was a judge on the Association of Photographers Awards. Um, the AOP um, is, is a big organization that represents professional photographers. And um, they had the student awards. I was one of the judges on the student awards. And the winner in my category was a guy called Michael Duckworth, as you can see there. He was in the category things. I, I was the judge on that particular category. And um, some of the entries in that category were really impressive. This was Mick Duckworth's uh, winning shot. And I just thought I'd give Mick a shout out here because what, what I had to do, one of the prizes for Mick was, uh, I don't know what he got from the AOP, but one of the prizes was uh, a little bit of one-to-one uh, -one, uh, coaching on Skype. We did a couple of um, 
portfolio reviews with him and talking about the photography industry, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and hopefully that was useful to him. So I thought I'd give him a little bit of a shout out on, uh, on this live session. So check out his work. He's got um, Mick, Mick Duckworth uh, or at Duckworth Photography on Instagram. Um, so you can have a look at uh, what he's done there and have a look at his stuff on the uh, Association of Photographers. So he's a young uh, sort of up and coming photographer. Uh, but it gave me an idea in that we do our own quarterly photography competitions. As a matter of fact, our next photography competition, we're giving away um, some bronze color lighting equipment. But I think what I'm going to do, because I think what would be really valuable is to also integrate potentially uh, some sort of one-on-one uh, -on -one communication with um, those that win the competition. Because it seems that a lot of photographers, they email us constantly saying, do you do portfolio reviews? Can you give me some business advice and one-to-one? -one? And obviously, you know, being a busy company and having thousands of members on Carl Taylor Education, we can't do that for everyone, it's just impossible. But what we might do is make that part of our prizes in our competitions because we already give away great prizes in our competitions on Carl Taylor Education but I might look at adding some extra bonus prizes in there in terms of um, if if you guys think it's useful to have a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review or a one-on-one -on -one business consultancy advice that sort of thing then we'll look at doing that so let us know if uh, you think that will be useful um, to uh, to you as a member on Carl Taylor Education. Now um, I want to talk about some, uh, I'm going to have a little rant in a moment about something that annoyed me. But before I do that, um, let me tell you about this thing. This is a Sony A7 S2. Beautiful camera, wonderful video camera. I use it for video. It's primarily designed for video. It's only a 12 megapixel stills, but it's designed for video. I completely ruined this one. This one is as dead as a donut because I've been working on a filming project and some of that filming uh, involved underwater filming and this is this is an underwater housing for the Sony a7 this is an Aquatica housing a really good housing I've used it many many times because I do a lot of diving and documenting shipwrecks etc uh, but we were using this for filming a project that we work on for filming the behind the scenes on a project and um, I had a flood in this camera uh, in this housing and I don't actually think it was the housing's fault. Uh, I may have not formulated one of the O-rings properly uh, or something's gone loose or I didn't make my checks properly because this housing's been superb. Uh, but on this particular uh, dive, I flooded it. This got wet, shorted out here. And now I've got to send this back for repair to see how much it's going to cost to fix it. Um, luckily, the sensor didn't get any seawater the battery got seawater, the memory card got seawater, the footage was sort of recoverable. Um, so overall, it doesn't look too bad, but it does not work at this moment in time. So that was a little bit annoying, but hey, that's what insurance is for. Pay a lot of money for insurance for the business company. So uh, we'll be uh, putting in a claim for that. Now, as well as that camera filming underwater, we were also filming underwater with the Hasselblad H6 medium format. Now, the interesting thing about this, the H6100, is it does raw 4K video footage. It's got its own, uh, they call it 3FV format, and it's an amazing format. I've basically been tasked with this project by Hasselblad to produce a short film, uh, which we'll be releasing soon, and it's looking really wonderful. I am amazed at the 4K footage this thing turns out. Um, and we had to put this in another underwater housing. There's very few of them available. We had to actually use a housing for a H3 camera, tweak things a little bit, get it in there. And uh, we were able to use that for recording um, to do what we wanted. Now, the, 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 what, the thing I'm going to move on to the rant before I give you the little liquify tutorial in a second, uh, was that we had to do filming. And the only filming it can do is on the C fast cards okay these are special cards they look like cf cards but they're called c fast cards they're extremely expensive we had a 64 gigabyte one but unfortunately that 64 gig card only holds six minutes of footage that this thing turns out because the 
bit rate is so high, the footage quality is so high. So I inquired about getting a, a larger card, a 256 gig card, and our usual video supplier, I won't name names, but our usual video supplier said, oh yeah, we've got one and uh, we bought it well in advance. Sent, they sent it over and when it got here, it was dead. It didn't work. It was a faulty one, didn't work. And I contacted them and I said, look, we've got the boat organized, divers organized, backup divers. I'm filming underwater, all this stuff organized. We need this sorted and uh, they let us down, unfortunately. Uh, we spent a lot of money with this company over the years, and if it was me, I would have said, no worries, Carl, that card's broken, we'll get one out to you in the post right now, and we'll deal with the return later. But this company wanted to deal with it by the book. They're very strict returns policy. They can't send out a new one or credit to you till they get the old one back. They won't deal with that until this has been dealt with, and to cut a long story short, the whole process of getting the faulty card back to them and then issuing a new one and the whole convoluted bureaucracy around that meant that we didn't get the 256 gig card in time and I was restricted to filming with a maximum of six minutes underwater on one of these and then having to surface and do bounce dives, which is a little bit dodgy, do bounce dives to make the footage and offload and, 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 and reload and, and do another dive. So I was extremely disappointed by that because to me, if you supply a service to a good client and that's a trustworthy client that always pays their bills on time, then the problem lay with the fact they sent us a faulty card. And immediately as that problem was identified, what they should have done is said, no problem, a new one is on its way to you. We'll deal with the faulty one afterwards. Let's just get you sorted. But that didn't happen, okay? What happened was a load of stupid bureaucracy about returns policies, credits, and everything else needed to be ticked before they'd send out the new card. And then there was a big problem with the courier, something went wrong with the courier, or oh, that didn't get done on time. All of these excuses were made and it resulted in me only being able to film six minutes of footage on the 64 gig card at a time. I was very disappointed and as a result, we've stopped doing business with that company. So, if you're in business or you deal with photographers, I think you should pay attention to customer service. That's what we do here at Carl Taylor Photography and Carl Taylor Education. We try to pay attention to customer service and customer requirements, okay? If you're in business and you've got a good customer, they have now lost our entire business and account. We will never buy another camera, video camera, lens, or anything from that company again. As a matter of fact, we already bought a replacement for this and we bought it from their competitor. So, there you are, well done that company. I'm not gonna name names, but you know you are, you balls it up. Right, we got some questions here. Rick Mentor says, would you a softbox or shoot through umbrella for group wedding pictures. Um, wouldn't make a lot of difference on a group wedding picture. The one thing you'd need to do, Rick, is look for more frontal lighting. Big groups, you're gonna get lots of shadows over each other if you're lighting from the side. So you need to get your lighting up higher and above and frontal. The bigger the um, modifier you can put there, the softer the light will be. So um, that's it really. Also keep in mind that the fall off of light because of the inverse square law, if you're shooting a big group, the closest ones in the groups to you are the ones in the middle. The ones at the end are further away, so they're gonna be darker. Miss Liss Bush says, what advice would you give to a student just graduating from photography school? Um, I don't know, what sort of advice would you like? I, I mean, if you're talking about what advice would you get in terms of uh, career and photography or that sort of thing, uh, it's all about passion. You need a lot of passion to succeed in photography. You need good work, you need to be tenacious, you need good marketing skills, you need a whole skill set wrapped around the business and the, uh, you know, the whole other side. You know, being a photographer, you're usually self-employed. So you're talking about running a business. So you've got to get that. It's not the whole arty farty world you might think it is that we see a lot of students come out with these sort of big ideas about all that. You have to understand how to run a business and uh, think about the numbers, think about your markets, think about supply, demand, your competitors, um, you know, pricing, all that sort of stuff as well. And you have to have good work, okay? That's the bottom line. 
Anthony Pizzoferrato, I hope I pronounced that correctly, says, Carl, how many years did you uh, do photojournal photojournalism work for National Geographic? How did they pick you up and did you continue to do this? Uh, no, I've not worked for National Geographic. I've worked for Geo Magazine. Um, I've worked for some of the Sunday supplement newspapers. I've worked for some uh, airline magazines, American Express Magazine, Hong Kong Standard, Telegraph, different uh, ones, but not National Geographic. Uh, Geo Magazine is kind of similar to National Geographic. I did that for uh, a couple of years. Uh, traveling, working freelance. Uh, you didn't get paid a lot of money. I was basically working from one project to the next and then got paid for that project and then used that money to, f you know, to fund the next project. But I really enjoyed the work, enjoyed the experience, enjoyed getting my work published and out there. Um, so, uh, but no, I don't continue to do this now. That was 25 years ago, if the more actually, 30 years ago. And I did that for a few years and then I moved into advertising photography uh, after assisting in advertising studios and then becoming um, just enthralled with the whole concept of light manipulation. Uh, Amis Rosic, I'm looking to buy a new video and photography camera. What do you think about the Sony a7R III? Well, it's very similar to this. If you want it more for photography than the R3, yes. If you want it for video than the a7S II, but the a7R III does good video as well. Joshua Fotara, Carl, I heard that photos taken on 19th century cameras have a quality that allows extreme I've heard infinite cam magnification without loss of resolution. Is that true? And if so, how possible? Uh, it's not true. Right, if they want to see more behind the scene, blah, blah, blah. oh, next Thursday's vlog. Apparently, we're, so I've just been messaged by one of the crew here. Uh, they're gonna see behind the scenes on some of the dive project I was just talking about with next the next vlog we're doing. Um, Rendell Smith, how do you like the Blad on the desk? Rendell, I love the Blad. I've shot with Blad for 15 years. I'm a global ambassador for Hasselblad and um, it's an amazing camera, best camera in the world in my opinion. Um, Raphael Mashi Sorby, Carl, I can't remember where I saw the video where you build the frame with the diffusion material. That is in carltaylereducation.com, okay? So 12 pound a month, get everything. All our training, live shows, the lot. You get it all for 12 quid a month. You can't say fair on that. So cheap, it's a bargain, okay? Just go for it, go and check it out. Have a look, stay for a month, stay for two, whatever you want. Right, now talking about live shows, uh, let me bring up actually our website. We've got a guest over tomorrow, a friend of mine, fellow photographer. Um, he shoots amazing product and advertising photography. Um, I do sort of similar work, but he does uh, a lot of other stuff as well. And he's more sort of active as a commercial photographer, whereas obviously we've sort of diversified into training. But I love his work. Um, he does some great stuff. We've got Barry Macaroo over tomorrow in the studio doing a live photography talk with me. This is Barry's work. You can see he's got some fantastic stuff, lots of amazing clients. He's worked for Samsung, uh, you know, all the big beer labels, Tom Ford, cosmetics, all sorts of stuff, Pepsi. He works, does a lot of amazing watch photography, um, tons of stuff Barry does. Very talented guy. Uh, he's gonna be on the sofa with me tomorrow night at 6 p.m. UK time, 1 p.m. New York time. I'm gonna be interviewing Barry about his work, his techniques, he's gonna show some behind the scenes, he's gonna give some tips, he's very forthcoming with, uh, with how he works and how he does things. You'll be able to ask questions as well. So if you've got any questions for Barry, log on, live shows, into the chat role, and you can ask questions that will be relayed to Barry, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them. Um, so uh, join us tomorrow night. We'd love to have you there. It's gonna be a great show with, uh, with Barry. Right, take a couple more questions, then I'm gonna move on to this uh, tutorial. Um, oh, actually, yes, we'll come on to that other thing in a second. Right, Mano says, uh, what is the minimum budget for a medium format for a startup? Well, I'm selling my old medium format camera for um, five and a half grand at the moment. Um, I've already sold it, someone's buying it, but you can buy a really good medium format kit set up for about five grand second hand. Um, someone else asks, Marcelo says, uh, greetings from Argentina. Most versatile lens for macro you use, would you prefer 150 or 100? Um, I prefer a 100 because you can shoot 
the, the, the distance away from the subject is closer, so I think the product shots look a little bit more intimate. As a matter of fact, I generally shoot with an 80 millimeter or my 100 mil lens on the Hasselblad. That's equivalent, 100 mil is equivalent to 80 mil, and 80 mil is equivalent to about 60 mil, 50 mil, and then I just put an extension tube on it and shoot with that. That allows me to shoot closer to uh, my subject. And as a matter of fact, if you sort of look at some of um, my product work, you can see that sort of intimate feel that I give by shooting quite close uh, to my subjects. I think we did a really good one recently that, dem oh yeah, this one here. Um, so this one with the uh, liquid splash around the Chanel bottle, again, you'll see what my lens choices are and my lighting choices. That's all there in that particular module. Again, I'm gonna point it out one more time, 12 pound a month. It's worth 12 quid if you just wanna watch one module, but you get the lot, you get everything, you get all of it for 12 quid. I mean, it's like we're giving it away. I mean, how are we gonna even pay to feed ourselves at 12 pound a month? I don't know. Right, moving on. Michael Forecast says, I'd like to come and see you in Paris in June. What would be the topics of this class? Well, Michael, I am in Paris in June doing a workshop jointly with uh, Broncolor and Hasselblad, and they're doing a very uh, uh, reasonable price. And I've actually, Michael, got an article about it on our blog. So if you go to the blog and you see Paris Photography Workshop with Carl Taylor, there is some information about it there, the studio location, the link to the studio, price of the workshops, and it is 100 euros per person for the day. And there's a rough schedule listing of what I'm going to be covering on that workshop. But it's not set in stone because I haven't actually decided, but I'm gonna be doing some product stuff, I'm gonna be doing some beauty stuff, I may do some liquid stuff as well. We've got a whole day, um, but I've got to work out a few things with Broncolor in France, et cetera, et cetera, in the studio of what we can do there. Um, but there you go, Michael, check out the, uh, the blog post. Carl, if you were to buy just one light modifier, which one would it be? It's funny, that question comes up a lot. I would buy a Para 133. It's extremely expensive, I'm afraid, uh, but it is so versatile. You can turn it into a hard light, a soft light, a parabolic, uh, very three-dimensional light. You can put a diffusion front on it to make it into a beautiful, big, round, soft box. It folds up quite compact for working on location. It works for business portraits, portraiture, beauty shots, fashion shots. It's an amazing modifier. If you can't afford it, then uh, an Octobox 150 would be also a good modifier, but it doesn't have the bite or three-dimensionality that the Para has. Um, Chaz, Dolph, how do you get into big clothes brands as a model photographer? Very difficult, Chaz. The, only the very top-end photographers are in that little network world shooting for Giorgio Armani, Armani and Duke Gucci and Dolce Gabbana and all that sort of stuff. They're getting paid 50,000 upwards per photo shoot. It's a very closed club. Um, I bet you've got to do a lot of networking to get in that club. Um, Vitala Gopi, hi Carl sir. What is the difference between the X1D and H6D sensors? Nothing on the 50 megapixel, it's exactly the same sensor. On the 50 megapixel camera, um, it's the same sensor. On the 100 megapixel, it's a bigger sensor, not just in resolution, but in physical size as well. Right, now let's stop the questions for a moment. I'm going to move on to um, doing, uh, showing you something about the new Liquify command in um, Photoshop. Now, obviously I need a picture of a person to liquefy, to change the shape of their eyes, their nose, their mouth and everything. Uh, and I thought, who could I use? I could use myself, but I thought, no, why use myself? So I picked on Tim. Tim, my good colleague and work associate, our creative director here and, and cameraman extraordinaire. Um, here he is. This is the portrait I shot of Tim. Uh, a few years ago. So I'm going to distort Tim's head now in Liquify. I've asked his approval and he said it would be all right. So let's, let's distort Tim's head in Photoshop. So I'm opening, opening Photoshop CC and uh, let's take a look at this. Oh, look, my menus are all over the shop here. Ha, all over the shop, they're all over the Photoshop. Right, now you go into filter you go into liquify command and now what's new in the liquify command let me just make him fit in there fit in fit on screen there he is now you've got all these new 
features. It's in this tab here called Face Aware Liquify. Now this may sound a bit gimmicky at first, but actually I found this really useful. Conventionally, the liquify tools were up here top left and they still are. So you had a warp tool so you could like make move someone's eye up or bend something like that or you could push someone's nose across or do that sort of thing in liquify. And I used it for sort of fine tweaking little things in uh, you know my fashion images or beauty images, just changing the curves of things a little bit, shapes of things, getting rid of wrinkles, clothes, that sort of stuff. Um, but now, They've gone even further with the commands. Let's take a look at this stuff. Look at this menu here. We've now got all of, how do you, how did I get, you know, remember, would you remember what the shortcut was for enlarging the image? No, I can't remember. I was able to, yeah, but anyway, forget it. Right, so we've got eye size, eye height, eye width, eye tilt, eye distance, nose height, nose width, smile, upper lip, lower lip, mouth width, mouth height, forehead, chin height, jawline, face width. Now, let me show you what some of this does. So this one here is for the left eye. So, oops, hold on a minute. I've got a problem. This is because of the HDMI. I'm gonna have to quit and start again. This is a bug that happens sometimes when we are connected in with a HDMI cable into um, the screen so that you can see what we're doing. We've obviously got to port this through a HDMI cable and sometimes that bug happens. So let me just see if I can eradicate that bug. Yes, okay. Right, look at Tim's eye. Look, see how I'm just changing his eye. I can change that one eye by just changing eye size on that one. If I move up to that slider, I can change that eye. Now that might seem a bit gimmicky, but when it comes to eye tilt, this is really useful because some people's eyes are not always straight. So you can actually kind of straighten up people if they've got a little bit of a squint or their eyes at a slightly different angle. You can make things a little bit symmetrical. You can change even the eye distance. So we can bring his eyes together. We can make him look like a hammerhead shark um, or we can put him back to normal. So you've got all this versatility and control now on the individual components of someone's face, nose height, nose position, um, we can even mess around with uh, nose width. So let, let's just make a few changes on Tim's, right? So I'm gonna shrink his nose in a little bit. I'm gonna make his nose a little bit longer. I'm gonna make his eyes a tiny bit bigger there. A little bit, get him even. Uh, we're gonna look at the eye height there. So I'm gonna bring that eye down a little bit in height or back to where it was, that one there. Um, eye width, I think the eye width was okay. Uh, we're now going to move on to the smile. We can make his smile look a bit more serious or we can increase the smile. So we've now got the smile control. So if your portrait candidate, your business portrait subject wasn't quite smiling enough, you've now got this control where you can, you can make it more subtle or you can enhance it a little bit. Change the size of the lip, making the upper lip a little bit larger, the lower lip a little bit smaller. Mouth width, wider, narrower, okay? Uh, mouth height shrink the height of the mouth a little bit. Then we can move on to the forehead. We can make his forehead taller, lower. Number of options there. Chin height, longer, little bit shorter. Some of these things would look a bit weird. I mean, look how weird that looks, okay? That looks weird as well. So um, we're just gonna find the point where it looks good. We're gonna look at jawline. We can change the thickness of the jaw, and then we can also take a few pounds off him as well, or add a few pounds with face width. So all of these things, and if I just flick on and off, that's what we had, and there we are now. So you can kind of change the whole perception of someone, and that's why you don't want to overdo it with these things, but sometimes I find when you're doing sort of business portraits or portrait shots, that someone might have just squinted their eye a little bit, or just something about the tilt of their head or something that affects it. And it even works when the face is at a slight angle. You still got this control. The software recognizes the individual components of the face. So I think this is a very clever, um, intuitive addition to the Photoshop CC collection and to the Liquify commands. If you're not familiar with the Liquify command and the power of the Liquify command, then check out our post-production sections in carltaylereducation.com. We give you some very in-depth tutorials on uh, Photoshop, right from beginners, right up to advanced pro level. We've got several different course levels for, for you in there on post-production. Right, now let's move on uh, to my next um, topic. How do I get out of this? Cancel. 
Right, let's cancel Tim out of there. Quit Photoshop. Now, um, can I quit? Is it quitting? Come on, quit. Quit. Thank you. Right, uh, yeah. Talking about uh, facial features and recognition, did you see this over on Petapixel? This is NVIDIA. Now, now NVIDIA make graphics cards um, for computers, and they're a big company. Uh, now they're moving into all this AI, um, artificial intelligence stuff. They are ne they've now created this artificial intelligence that can do a content-aware fill. So this is the picture, and the software uh, can basically recognize the problem and just create a new image for you. I mean, incredible. I don't know what it's sourcing to do that, how it's doing it. Obviously, she still looks a bit funny there because one of her eyes has come out really weird. Uh, but the fact that it could just take what was completely no eyes at all and slap two eyes in there. This one is particularly amazing. Look at this completely wrecked picture. And then the artificial intelligence, uh, that's what Photoshop would have done with its content aware fill. And the NVIDIA one did that with it. Now, of course, it doesn't look very pretty still. There are some issues there, but it's rebuilt it from that, which is quite incredible. Photoshop's Content Aware did that big splodgy mess. NVIDIA's did that. Um, so, and there's the original photo, and it obviously had no reference to the original photo other than what you can see there in that deteriorated shot. So this is quite um, amazing stuff. There's another example there. Another example, you know, it's re not just faces, it's rebuilt a building, rebuilt a waterfall shot. You can read more about that over on uh, Petapixel. So it's amazing what this artificial intelligence stuff is doing. I wonder where it's going to go. We've seen huge leaps with um, computer graphics, 3D rendering. Um, someone said to me a while ago, why do you shoot products anymore? Why don't you render them? Why do you do a whiskey bottle and render it? Well, the answer is I can do it much faster as a photograph and it still looks more realistic than the 3D render. And a 3D render takes a lot longer, so it's still not the most efficient way of doing it. And at the end of the day, clients will dictate what they want. When the day arrives that a 3D render of a product uh, you know, a bottle of whiskey, an electronics, a, you know, a perfume shot. When the day arrives that it's quicker and more realistic and more controllable to render it and more cost effective, then that's when it will start getting used, okay? All these things are driven by simple business economics because they are pictures for businesses. Let's take another couple of questions here. Um, we're going to wrap this up soon, so if you've got any more questions, fire them in. Uh, we've got uh, Vital Gopi says, Hi, Carl, sir. Oh, no, we've already answered that one. That was about the sensor. Jam Jaramir Ondra says, Which wide-angle lens is the best? What can you advise? Well, it depends on the format that you're shooting on, but if you're shooting on full-frame 35mm, I really like the 16 to 35 millimeter lens. That goes from a super wide angle to wide angle, and it's a really nice range, I find anyway. Mano Yurtanian says, can I use the new Hasselblad digital back on the Hasselblad H1 or the Hasselblad 500C old camera? I don't know the exact answer, but there is a back that they make that is compatible with the 500C, I believe, and with the old H1. They've done like some sort of... Um, mechanism fitting uh, to do it. You'd have to check on Hasselblad's website uh, and check with the guys at Hasselblad. Unfortunately, I don't, uh, it's been a long time since I used a H1. I've never tried fitting that back on a H1. I don't think it would go directly on it, but there are some backs that they sell as separate backs that attach to some of the older cameras. So check with Hasselblad on that. Zacharia says, greetings from Morocco. When are you going to do a photo competition again? Well, we do them all the time, Zacharia. Just check on our website, carltaylereducation.com. Um, if you go on our website, you will see that our competitions are here. So the photography competitions are listed. Uh, they're there. That one's already closed. There's the next one where you win a Cirrus lighting kit. That one ends in June, okay? And as I said, we're probably going to add um, portfolio reviews or extra prizes in for uh, members who win the competitions because it's not always about prizes. Some people want to just have that personal connection, bit of uh, business consultancy or portfolio advice, which um, you know we'll be happy to give as, a, as an extra prize uh, within our competition. So uh, Zacharia, just look at our website, carltaylereducation.com. You'll see the competitions. You'll see the live shows. Um, you'll see everything that we do. And as I said, tomorrow we've got Barry, 
on the live show talking about his advertising, his amazing advertising product photography work. So um, check that out. Join us at 6 p.m. tomorrow evening, UK time and 1 p.m. New York time. One more question, just come in. Uh, Shiz Nuts, what a name. Right, they say, do you shoot street photography with a compact film camera like a Contax T2 or something? Do you shoot on film at all? No, my days of shooting on film ended in 2005 when I bought my first Hasselblad H1. Um, I'd done street photography um, on that. Um, cover, cover, you know, I've shot street photography because I used to do journalism uh, and I enjoy it, but I don't do a lot of it. My main realm is in the studio now. Um, so, um, no, it's not something that I do. And no, I don't shoot on film anymore. OK, right. Um, new courses. Let's just have a quick look at new courses that are coming up as well. In our fashion section, we've just started releasing some new modules. We've got all these uh, new fashion modules coming soon. So look out for those. Again, just a reminder, £12 a month on carltaylereducation.com. Give us a try for just one month to see how good it is and see why thousands of other photographers are raving about what we're doing over here. We'd really appreciate you as members and we look after our members. So give us a try if you've not 